We've been teaching the marketing path of direct to retail, meaning you start your business selling direct to consumer. There you grow awareness, take smaller risks, and build your funding through profitable sales from your website and Amazon, and then go to retail for many years. Overall, this process has proven to be more profitable and faster growing than jumping to retail too soon. Today's guest executed this approach perfectly and is now in over 35,000 retailers and continuing to grow. He shares his journey and some valuable advice to help you wherever you are in your journey to harvest the growth potential of your business. Are you looking for new ways to make your sales grow? You've tried other podcasts, but they don't seem to know. Harvest the growth potential of your product or service as we share stories and strategies that'll make your competitors nervous. Now, here's the host of the Harvest Growth Podcast, John LeClaire. I'm excited to have on Josh Groff. He's the CEO of More Labs, which is the maker of Morning Recovery and a few other brands as well. If you are familiar with this brand, you may have seen it's in tens of thousands of retailers across the country, and they do a great business online as well. It's a fantastic product, proven for success, but a really interesting story behind it as well. Josh, first of all, I want to welcome you to the show today. Hey, what's up? Thanks, John. Thanks for taking the time today. I really appreciate it. I know how busy you are running this really successful business and for sharing your story. So the behind the scenes of Morning Recovery, can you tell our audience if they're not familiar with that product or your company a little bit more about Morning Recovery and your company, More Labs? Yeah, of course. Uh, we're called More Labs. We're based here in Los Angeles, California, founded in 2017. Uh, we make functional shots. So morning recovery, as you talked about, was uh, that's really our first product to market that we came out with in 2017. It is a uh, preventative shot when you're taking uh, when you're drinking any kind of alcohol that you don't wake up with uh, some of those nasty after effects like headache, body ache, nausea, uh, all the fun things associated with drinking alcohol. Uh, we've really grown morning recovery a ton over the last seven years. And then along the way, we've launched two other functional brands. Uh, one is called liquid focus, which is a cognitive enhancement shot that gives you a boost of energy, but also helps you get really kind of locked in and laser focused. And then a shot called Dreamwell, which is a, uh, better for you sleep supplement that helps you get to sleep faster, stay asleep, but also wake up feeling refreshed and recharged. So. Uh, with those three brands as part of our portfolio, really our, our goal as a company is to elevate the daily performances and, and really help you kind of get the best out of each and every day and be the most productive version of yourself. Uh, so that's what we aim to do here uh, through all of our products. And it's so smart owning a supplements business to think about longevity of the business, right? You've done, you've had great success with your first product, right? Morning Recovery, which has done so well in retail and direct to consumer. It's great to add on other products. I've got a couple here as well into the mix to think about growing your customer base where some people may not have the need for your first product, but will for the other products, right? Or once they know you and know your brand and frankly love you and trust you, now you can speak to that same audience by sharing benefits that are sort of similar, right? They're, they're different products, but they're trusted in terms of the way that you guys come together from a scientific development process, right? So when they have one product that works well, they'll trust you on the others. And it's a great way to grow your business. So yeah, kudos on doing that. Yeah. And that was the goal in, in thinking of frequency of use, right? So you're exactly right. Where um, obviously people aren't getting out, they're not out drinking alcohol for the most part every day. And so uh, morning recovery, while there are, 150 million people in America that drink alcohol at some level. So there's a, a huge potential market base you can go after, but people aren't drinking alcohol every day on the average. And so we really wanted to have other products that would increase frequency of use, but also listening to our consumers. We asked our customers and said, what are some of the daily stressors that slow you down when you're trying to be your most productive self? And, you know, the number one thing is, Hey, I, I either have a lot of trouble focusing or kind of having enough energy to, to really get through some of those tough tasks or uh, I just don't sleep all that well. And, and since we came out with those products, I mean, both energy in its own way and sleep are both huge categories, but we really wanted to put something forward that we thought was a better solution and, and was really representative of what we're trying to do here at More Labs. And so far, they've been great. So we do try to hit kind of all those facets of life between morning, afternoon, nighttime, that kind of thing. So it's, uh, it's been going great. 
And I love them. They're, they're great trademarks, right? So I believe all three of the are trademarked, right? Registered trademarks, not just morning recovery, but, but this one specifically, your first one, your hero morning recovery, it's a very descriptive trademark. So my audience has probably heard me say this before, but attorneys listening, I'm sure like, oh, that's a terrible trademark, right? Cause it's, it's something that is like very descriptive. It tells what it does and it's easy to copy or get close to, right? From a marketer's perspective. So from your and my perspective, it's an amazing trademark. And we had the same thing happen at OxyClean. You know, again, attorneys would say terrible trademark. It uses oxygen to clean, right? And But the thing is, it's memorable. And when we're starting out a business, building a brand, building awareness, without, I would say, wasting tens of millions of dollars and building awareness, right? When you've got a descriptive trademark, something that's more memorable, it saves you so much money because when people see it, when they hear about it, they're more likely to remember it means you have to show it to them fewer times or spend less money for them to remember and come back to you and purchase. I'm a huge believer in descriptive trademarks like this when you can get them, right? They're not easy to get. It takes time and effort and, of course, the importance of registering the trademark. But what are some of the benefits you've seen, you think, in running this business with such a great descriptive trademark? Um, yeah, and it's interesting listening to you say that. I think you're a lot more eloquent about it than, than maybe we thought about as we moved along. Um, I think about I mean, one of the biggest challenges in retail, as you know, is you walk into a wall of products and beverages that are various colors and sizes, and, and you only have that consumer's attention for a, a very split second if they've never heard or seen your brand before to really describe exactly what you do. And so you can either do that, of course, through your package or your vessel or your name or, you know, there's only wording that's on your packaging, but there's only a, a hot second for you to be able to do that. And so um, when we set out to name our products, we wanted them to be so simple for people that uh, to understand, but also people maybe that English wasn't their first language and just things that it would immediately tip you off as to exactly what we're trying to do and what the function is. And, and that way it would, make it hopefully a little bit less expensive for us to have to, to support with a ton of marketing and events to kind of gain awareness around it. But to your point, now that we have protected those and we, we do have those names, I mean, we've had retailers time after time that say, um, hey, there's there are a lot of brands and people have to ask me constantly what it does or a consumer would feel a little embarrassed to ask a clerk what this product does. So they just opt not to buy it and it sits there Versus your products, it comes in. I know exactly what it is. Like I want to feel better in the morning. I want to get you know a little bit of focus and energy here to get going, and I want to get a great night's sleep. So um, we've seen a lot of advantages to that, and definitely has been appreciated by retailers. And I think it's a good thing to think about. I couldn't think of the word before, but the attorneys I've spoken with typically use the word fanciful, right? If you can have a fanciful trademark, something like a made up word, it is easier to protect for sure, right? You have to fight harder to protect your brand when it's a descriptive one. But along the way, you'll have, you'll be able to reach that point of success where you can protect it. And, you know, like she said, I, I love the analogy too, not just remembering it from an ad, but also seeing it on the shelf in retail and understanding instantaneously what it does for you. It, it can be so important. Now on the topic of messaging, I know one of the things you and I have talked about before is the difficulty of selling a product like this is not being able to say the word hangover, I think, because it's a medical claim or maybe, maybe you word it differently than that. But having to avoid a medical claim or a word like that, which is really what you're doing is you're helping to prevent or to recover from a hangover, but you can't say hangover. And so how have you overcome that, that messaging hurdle? Well, unfortunately, the, the, before we overcame it, we, we stepped right into it and made the mistake. So um, I, think, I think a lot of brands in this space uh, have done the same thing. And um, we were we didn't really know as much around what how the FDA and the FTC regulate uh, certain language and claim substantiation. So um, that should be uh, said. We're, we weren't we weren't brilliant out of the gate. We stepped right into it and, and had to clean up some things and and you know make some apologies for claims that we weren't allowed to make. Um, and now, as we see so many people flood the space that are doing the exact same thing, it, it's interesting. We've tried, I try to reach out to people and just advise them as much as I can on, on what's legal, what's not, just to save them some heartache and finances. But uh, people still do it. But you know, once we kind of learned that and moved on, and we can't say hangover and have to get a lot more creative with how we describe what the product is meant to do, um, then it gets really choiceful in terms of how exactly what words you use. This is a tiny bottle. As you said, it's, it's only a hundred milligrams uh, or milliliters. And 
we only have so much space on the bottle. So it has to be a really short, succinct, simple way to describe exactly what we do without actually having to say the word hangover or other things that are not uh, allowed. And so uh, to be fair, it hasn't been it hasn't been easy. We've, we've done a lot of modifications over the years. We've iterated. We've tried different things. Um, and really what we, what we went for is we try to use every piece of the packaging space that we can. So on the front, uh, underneath morning recovery, it says drink today, feel great tomorrow. Shortest amount of words that we can to, to convey what this product does to the consumer and then when to take it, uh, take while drinking makes it, you know, as, as simple as we can make it. So again, a lot of trial and error. Um, a lot of testing with our, our not only on our ads and, and seeing kind of what gets traction on social and, and when we do place ads, where what's that click through rate based on the language, but then also just a lot of feedback and uh, from both distributors and retailers to kind of find the, the best way to describe it. But it hasn't been easy uh, and it's kind of a constant work in progress, but we're getting there. And I think it's important to talk about these two topics next to each other because, you know, at least, I, again, I'm no attorney. I don't want to give legal advice here, but on the trademark side, being descriptive, you know, even though attorneys may recommend an alternative path, right, to use fanciful language or whatever, medical claims are not something you want to mess with. This is definitely where you want to follow your attorney's advice, steer clear of any potential issues on making claims. Now, a lot of them, you can get caught by Facebook or TV channels, depending on how you market it, right? Or potentially retailers, they might catch some things, um, which is good, right? It helps us to avoid potential issues, but it's always helpful to talk to an attorney to make sure you're clear, right? You're, you're talking about it in the right way that's gonna be safe. And then finding, the hard part now becomes, okay, finding the marketing language that'll work, it'll convey what your product does, inferring maybe the claim or the benefit of the product, but not making those medical claims and making sure we steer clear of those. So let's talk about successes of the business. So you've had some great success along the way. We'll get into that in a little bit, but what was your first success you had as a business? Um, so when the business was first started, you know, back in 2017, we were, we needed like any brand does needed funding and needed to figure out a way we'd, we'd, we'd uh, come up with a formula, kind of some bench top samples and, um, the founder of the business, his name is Si Sun Lee, he had created these bench top samples. And then at that point, we really thought, hey, this is an interesting product, but we need to actually find a way to fund it. So we went on to a, uh, a crowdfunding uh, website, tried to raise 25000 just as a way to kind of get a little bit of gas in the tank, see what we could do. Um, I think we really did a good job of describing what the product was designed for and what the goal was going to be for the product. And it got uh, tremendous traction. We tried to raise 25000 And then in just three days, we raised $250,000, um, which was a, a real signal to us that it was something that was in demand and that people were looking for. And so we took that money and we gave all of it to University of Southern California's School of Pharmacy in the form of a research grant. Uh, so we would actually be sponsoring a grant around alcohol metabolization, uh, the effects of alcohol on the body. And then really, we knew that if we were going to come forward with a product and put something out there that we wanted it to be the most scientifically backed and most effective product that we could. And the best way to do that is based here in LA was working with our, our local uh, university and a tremendous group of uh, tenured physicians and scientists that uh, took that grant money and then came back with what we believe is uh, the best product in the market in morning recovery. So, um, you know, that was a, a tremendous win for us just to get out of the gate with not only using, having that money available and being able to put that directly into the science, which is very expensive into the research, uh, but then having a product that we felt was really uh had had the the markings of everything that we needed to be successful in the market and having that backing from true research behind it so that that was our first win um and then you know once we kind of were able to take that message and really get a little bit of press around it go dtc get online we were just seeing really strong sales out of the gate uh which was a real lucky lucky break for us i guess it's so tempting, I think, you know, I've, we've had other crowdfunders on this show or people that have you know, raised money through crowdfunding or whatever your means might be. You get an influx of cash that comes in and it's a hard decision of where to put that money, right? It can be lifestyle, right? Unfortunately, some have, have gone that direction, but sinking it, you know, even when you're putting it back into the business, where do you put it, right? And is it more in marketing or is it more in product development or labeling, et cetera? Or what you've done is kind of R&D, right? To perfect 
the product and to do that early stage. How'd you make that decision to put, you know, a big sum of money right into R and D in the very beginning to, you know, make sure you got it right. You know, I, th- I think that the, in today's, in today's information age, where just people can share so quickly. I mean, you're going to end up spending so much more money to put lipstick on a pig, so to speak, you know, it, it, it has to stand on its own. And in a former life, I owned a restaurant for four years. And, you know, one of the things I learned about Yelp and reviews is if you don't have a quality product, then you just get torched out of the gate. So it's, it's really important that all those reviews come in positive. And so if you take just the fact that information travels so quickly, but then also the fact that looking at these types of products that are for uh, hydration and prevention of hangovers through alcohol consumption, it's a big category in Asia, but it's not a big category here in the U.S. And so if we were going to be really one of the leaders to bring this category to the U.S., but immediately the reviews were just faulty at best, um, it's just not a great place to start. So we knew if we were going to do that, it needed to be all in and we needed to feel that the actual science in the background was bulletproof and that we had something that truly we could stand behind so that those positive reviews as information shares so quickly. I mean, the biggest thing is your, if your friend tells you, Hey, I picked this thing up at the, the, the liquor store the other day, I gave it a shot and it sucked, you know, then, then they're going to tell 10 people that it sucked. So we don't, we didn't want to be there. We want to make sure that people say, Hey, this was, this worked. I can't believe it. But next time I go out and I drink, I'm going to try another one. That's, that's what we had to do. Uh, it's it's genius. It's you know if I could again compare it to the OxyClean journey from back in in the day, you know what helped us make OxyClean so successful in the early days was the fact that it worked right. So it, as genius as Billy Mays was as a talent, if you remember back right the original heydays of OxyClean, Heck yeah, yeah. It, he was amazing at getting trial right. Getting he could sell anything to anybody right. The nice thing with OxyClean, what made it successful, like your product, is when you get it in your home and you try it, it works you're going to buy it again and again and again, right? So it's about making it work, function really well, actually do what you purport to do. And then the marketing, you know, is, is I don't want to call it secondary. You still got to get the word out, right? You can have yeah. a great product and not talk about it in the right way. No one's going to buy it. But if you get your marketing dialed in and your product dialed in, really there's no better combination to drive a growing business for the long term, for sure. Yeah. So you have really kind of what I, you'd follow a path that I would refer to as direct to retail, right? So it's a phrase we often use at Harvest Growth. It's starting with the direct to consumer business and then driving that into retail sales. Again, back to my, you know, my Oxygen history, but so many other product launches we've done over the years. When you get the awareness up through direct response, you're learning at a lower risk in a lower risk area, right? If you need to change your pricing or your messaging or really figure these things out when you're selling onesie twosies in the very, very beginning of a campaign, it's safer than when you have a big order you send off to Walmart or Target or GNC, or whatever it might be. You send out thousands, tens of thousands or more sometimes, it's harder to fix it, right? Or make changes. It's a longer t- cycle, et cetera. So it's a great process. And it's kind of what you followed where you had great success early on direct to consumer. Now your retail side of your business has really grown and any, I guess, learnings along that path that have been really helpful to you guys or whether they're hurdles you had to cross or whether they're successes that you learned along the way of using that approach of starting direct and really driving retail sales? Well, I mean, we have being around seven years, it feels like it's dog years, I guess, a little where we've been, we've been around forever, but it, it's not that long, but it just takes, it's been a lot of lumps and a lot of learning as any small brand has to go through. So um, I, I think that perfect example is we, one of our products, uh, after we started to expand out of morning recovery, we took a chance on kind of a new product, wanted to find some new things. And we had tested it amongst, uh, kind of our super users of our other product within our own company. And we'd had, uh, everything was safe, but just people's actual, the body reacts differently to different ingredients. And we wanted to get it out to market. And so we made, uh, we made a whole run of it. And then as we started to get it out, even directly to our consumers, we started to get feedback from not a large amount, but 10% is enough of, a, of an amount that, you know, if something's not perfect, you don't want it to be out on the market if it affects people differently. And there was one specific ingredient that we needed to take out in order to make sure that we weren't getting that reaction. And we had to take $250,000 worth of product and essentially throw it in the garbage. And, you know, again, that was that we hadn't, 
we hadn't done the right steps to launch a product and bring it to market first. So that was a problem. Um, but it, it is nice within uh, a direct to consumer approach where you can, especially when you're selling things through your own website, where you have direct info and, and relationship with that customer, where you can get direct feedback. You can get people that actually write directly into your customer service team and tell them like, Hey, this one tastes funny or how come it, it was supposed to taste this way and it didn't or, or whatever that feedback would be. And it, it allows you to, to hear that directly compile as much of it and find those trends. And then over time, uh, continue to iterate and improve your product. And back in the old days, when we first started, we are a functional beverage first, and it has to be effective. But a lot of times with functional beverages and those ingredients, they don't always, those ingredients don't taste great. And so in the early days of morning recovery, as we'd hand it to a consumer or hand it to a buyer, we'd always have to, before they opened it, you know, they'd crack it open and we'd be like, wait, 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 oh, well, hold on. So, you know, just so you know, this is functional. It's supposed to, you know, it's going to do all these great things for you. It's not meant to be refreshing, et cetera, et cetera. Like you had to kind of give them the, the whole elevator pitch a little bit before they actually took a sip. And then they said, oh yeah, you know, it's, it doesn't taste great, but if it works, I guess it, it's fine. I'd rather have it work than not work. And, and now seven years later, we've just continued to like work really hard and iterate, iterate, iterate on the flavor. And now when people open it, they actually think that it's going to taste horrible because it's got a bunch of minerals and vitamins and ingredients. And they, they kind of are about to plug their nose in, and then they take the first sip and they look at it. It's like, oh, this is actually really nice. It's like, yeah, it's a very palatable, delicious product now, but that took years to get to. And it's always that iteration is really challenging, but it is, it is a lot easier and nicer to your point to have that kind of closed loop around feedback, uh, a, a feedback loop directly from that small group of customers that you trust that can give you the, the, the insights that you need to go make the product better every, every step of the way. Yeah. I want to jump back a little bit. You talked about $250,000 worth of product that you essentially had to throw away and it's, you know, it's, everything's in scale, right? That's a, it's a hard learning to go through, but it, you know, because you're on the direct to consumer path, had that been retail, right? If you're shipping it out to tens of thousands of retailers, now you're talking potentially millions of dollars in inventory, right? So it's, everything gets bigger and you're not going to find, I think you call it the feedback loop, right? Your feedback loop is so much longer in retail to get those learnings, you may not find if there's a taste issue, whatever it might be for months or, or potentially even longer. So it's, it's great to use that as a continual uh, way to grow the business by learning, by connecting to your consumer, by making changes to whether it's your existing product or new ones that you're launching. So it's a great way to, to talk about it. Now on the retail side, how many retailer outlets are you in right now? We are in about 35,000 doors. That's fantastic. Any any tips or learnings on that journey? So how did you go from it being direct to consumer in the early days, so your website and Amazon, et cetera, into getting to over 30,000 retailers? So we knew that um, at the time, and this was six years ago, so the stats have probably changed a little bit, but high 90s, 98, 99% of alcohol was still purchased offline versus online. I'm sure that landscape continues to shift and it's it's not much different now, but it's it's probably a little bit more in the favor of deliveries and online services. But um, we needed to be where our consumer was with morning recovery. And so retail was the place that we were going to be able to scale the brand. It still is the place where we're going to be able to scale the brand and, and a place where people, you can drive trial and awareness because we are an impulse item at the register. You grab a bottle just because you're you see it, you know, you, you, everybody's done that where they just see something like, you know what, I'm going to give it a shot. Never had it before. Let's see. So it's a great way to drive awareness, drive trial. So we knew we needed to be in retail and our plan, because we had this direct to consumer data and we knew where people were ordering us online, we picked three markets that really kind of bubbled to the top of markets that seemed like we could have a real good shot at winning in retail. Those were Los Angeles for based here. San Francisco, uh, just because the founder's background being in technology um, and and really us being born in kind of the Silicon Valley area, that made a lot of sense. And then the third one was Chicago. We were getting a lot of online orders out of Chicago. It's a great food and beverage market. Anybody who's been there loves Chicago to go out and have a good time. So we picked those three markets and our hypothesis was if we can go deep in three markets and not try to scale too wide too fast but inch deep mile wide and show that we can start at the base deliver ourselves win at mom and pops eventually win over some chains get a distributor distributor then helps open up larger chains then we get into c-store then grocery then mass you know etc 
but we could stack it on top of each other and then demonstrate within one or two, three core markets that we were able to go deep and win in various channels and in different parts of town. Because you, you don't want to be a brand that's like, hey, I sell downtown, but I do terrible in the suburbs, or I, I sell great in upscale neighborhoods, but poorly in downscale. I mean, we really wanted to find that we could be, we could sell everywhere. And so that, that was really the, the blueprint that we followed for the first several years, even though it was painful. And we got a lot of offers for people that just said, hey, well, why don't you, why don't you talk to this chain that's over in Arkansas, this one in Florida? And frankly, we just said, we don't have anybody in Florida. I don't know how, we, we, we're not ready to do that. We, we had to stay as diligent as we could. And again, painfully so sometimes, but, but our goal was inch wide, mile deep, show that we could stack throughout channels and that we could, we could meet hurdle rates at all kinds of different retailers. Once we did that, and then we had this data, then we could go to the next big market, which we did. And we went and said, cool, like Texas, let's talk about Texas. Let's go. And then you bring that data to a retailer, you bring that data to a distributor, you have a way to get people excited. Like you've shown that you can win and that you know how to build a market and then replicate that across the country. We're still far from that. We're, we're not a huge brand still. I mean, we have, infinite may, way to go still to do that. But we now have found a blueprint uh, that we, when we do go into launch metro areas that has been successful and proven, and, and it's not the fastest model, but it is capital efficient and has shown that, that it works. And when you, you know, for audience sake, when you start off in smaller or not smaller, but a smaller number of cities or markets, you've got the opportunity to now market those, whether it's Facebook ads or whatever it might be, but you can choose those geographies and really drive up your awareness as opposed to trying to get nationwide when you've got one store here, one store, you know, they're kind of spread out around the country. It's harder if you've got focused in LA and San Francisco and, you know, et cetera, Chicago in the early days, it's easier to market to those to drive interest, awareness, and really grow, which drives success in retail. Like, you know, you talked about how you can take those success stories now to other retailers to make sure that they're successful as well as you grow this. You've also talked about trial a little bit. So getting people to try, being on the counter is one way to do that. Um, how is trial, getting people to try out your product once, helped your business? I guess, how do you do that? How do you get them to try the first time? And then, you know, what's been helpful to bring them back? Well, the number one way that we've found, I mean, there's, there's in the early days, it was a lot of social media advertising, targeting groups based on characteristics, and then trying to get a, an Instagram ad in front of that person as they're scrolling, get them to stop and then at least learn and take a chance on that. That was, that was early days. It's, it was expensive. Um, but we, it, it was a way for us to scale online and to gain trial and then fast forward into retail. Again, most, the biggest thing that we can do is in terms of driving trial is really attractive packaging, something that looks clean, it looks trustworthy. It is back to your point on the trademarks. It's really clear in an instant exactly what your product is intended to do so that when you do, when people do see it, it hits them in that need state. Second within retail is just positioning within the store. You can be at every store in America, but if you're on the bottom shelf in the vitamin area, you're never going to get seen, unfortunately, uh, unless people are looking for a very specific thing versus if you are uh, in less stores, but every store that you're in, you're right up at the register. So as you're checking out, you have to see it. Potentially the, the clerk is there that says, Hey, you're drinking. You ever tried morning recovery? It's, I sell a ton of it. People love it. Great. Kind of, you start to get all of this uh, cross pollination of just people talking about it, visibility, positioning within the store. There are other things that of course, running in a grocery store, anything that has a tag on it with a TPR and giving people a deal is going to always incentivize them to take it, pick it up and try it. But, but, but yeah, biggest things for us are just clear, very easy to understand packaging and, and presentation in terms of what the proposition is and then getting people to pick it up. And so that has been critical, which leads to, and you and I have talked about this, uh, before, but that's that leads to sips to lips for us, which is our number one goal within anything else that we do. It's just purely be boils down to sips to lips. You try it, you taste good, you believe it because it worked for you, and you are more likely to recommend it and remember it and repurchase it. And so, um, those kinds of things, and it's getting up at the register, I should say too, because if you, if you have small brands and things that listen to your podcast. 
getting up at the register can be really expensive. And people, a lot of times retailers hear it and they think slotting dollars and you have to pay for that. And what's been nice for us is we never really ask or pay for, for uh, front end space. Generally speaking, we have a product that is a four ninety nine ring for morning recovery at the retailer. So it's four, it's five bucks. It's small. It can fit in your pocket. And so we just tell them, Hey, we like to be in and around alcohol because that's where we sell. And then they say, well, I don't want it to disappear into someone's pocket. So I should put it up near the register. We say that I think that's probably a good idea. And we don't actually pay for that space. So it's, it's not easy to get up there, but that has been such a, a huge game changer for us in that shelf stable packaging that can, that doesn't have to be refrigerated and can live up the register where every single person that comes to the store that has to pay sees you and you get that impression has been really helpful. Well, and it's impulse and incremental, right? So these are obviously an impulse purchase potentially, but also it's incremental because it's there aren't a lot of competitors that do the same thing. So it's, you know, if you're buying, if you're in the liquor aisle, for example, coming up at a liquor store, you're not replacing a different purchase. You're adding this to the cart, which retailers love as well. And so as soon as they see that, that they're, this helps to grow their average cart value or average order value, it's you know all the more reason for them to take you on, but also to encourage more sales again, because you're not just choosing between the sea of different products. It's adding to the cart to grow their average purchase value, which really helps a lot. Well, Josh, are there any resources that you'd recommend, things that have been helpful to you in your business journey? For me, the, the biggest things have been mentorship and, and really just doing a great job of um, trying to network within your own uh category or, or area. I, I mean, I've, I've worked for, had the opportunity, thankfully, to work for some really, really bright people that have um, always been resources to me when I need to learn about leadership, learn about hiring, learn about um, creating strategies and, and just things of that nature. It's There's obviously so many great things that are available now to read and, and great publications. But, but for me, mentorship and my network has been the most helpful thing to me is I've, I've built this company, frankly. So i um, been blessed to have that. I think uh, even I, I think back to the first time I had to write my own pitch deck and I, I was terrible at it. I thought I was putting things in there that made sense. And then thankfully, my network I have a couple of people that work in the VC world that I was able to just do dry runs with and get feedback and feedback and feedback. And same with your products, right? You're just getting feedback, iterate, feedback, iterate. And I think uh, I think that's been really helpful is, is purely finding a couple people that you really respect how they do business, how they work with their employees, how they lead, and then um, getting that mentorship relationship with them so that you can feel com- comfortable and confident that they'll give you honest, real feedback. And then you can uh, continue to just improve and grow and, and iterate yourself as well. It's good advice. And for our audience sake, you know, don't go into this feeling like you can't start a business or grow a business without a mentorship group or network that's already built, right? So many business owners have been down the same path that we have, right? All of us in our, our journey at our different points in the journey and are willing to share, right? So you got to make a valid connection, provide some value of some sort, right? But, but if you don't have the network already, you can find mentors within your space that, you know, maybe they're answering a couple of questions for you. Maybe they become, you know, a, a partner of yours, right? Any, and anywhere in between, but reach out, connect with people through LinkedIn. I, I encourage everyone if you don't have that base already find a group of mentors that are further along than you in your space and it's only going to help you and, and please you know obviously return the favor to help others whether it's now or later in your journey that, that may approach you well josh this has been a really fun interview is there anything i didn't ask that you think could be helpful for our audience i don't think so i mean in terms of um what's helpful as just the the shameless pitch i mean we really believe the world, it's very interesting right now because within the world of wine and spirits and alcohol, there's a lot of articles about how uh, during COVID alcohol consumption was spiking. And then now that we're kind of post COVID alcohol consumption is declining and the con- and the, the category contracts a little bit. And um, I think that's healthy. And I think it's, it's interesting. I think that one thing that's always uh, for us now, and, and I've, I've become more aware of this as I've gotten a little bit older now, but it's, it's, more about conscientious drinking. And so um, I just don't process alcohol like I used to, and and most people don't. And so morning recovery is just a a for every time you drink kind of a product now. So it just, it's a good way to make sure that whether you have one or three, you wake up feeling refreshed and recharged and, uh, and ready to go. And uh, yeah, we're we're really excited about just the, the traction that we're seeing across the country 
morelabs.com. Uh, we're on Instagram at morelabs. You can find us at morelabs.com. We're on Amazon. We have over 3,000 five-star reviews. So it's out there and it's available. Well, thank you for sharing your story. I do encourage everyone, please watch for this in retail stores or check out the website or Amazon listing. Again, morelabs.com. It's in the show notes. If you're driving, don't feel like you have to take notes. As always, you can go to our website to, or any of your favorite podcasts in the show notes. You'll be able to find that. And I do want to tell our audience as well, make sure that you uh, reach out to us if you need help with your own product launch or growth of your business. You can actually use us for a 30-minute strategy consultation totally free. We've launched and grown hundreds of products since 2007 and learned some of our strategies while growing OxyClean back in the Billy Mays days. We're here to help. So please go to harvestgrowth.com and set up a call if you'd like to discuss further. 